good afternoon, everybody, on this really wet and stormy afternoon. Um, it's great to see so many people here. So my name is Louise Ryan, and I'm Professor of Sociology, and I'm also Director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre. And this is one of our regular Wednesday afternoon seminars. Just to say um, in the chat, my colleague Anna has typed the names of some of our forthcoming events. So we hope that if today is your first day attending one of our seminars, that you will please come back and visit us again for some of our other forthcoming events. We've got some very exciting events coming in, in the next uh, two months or so, really for the rest of the academic year. So I'm delighted today to invite my colleague, Dr. Josephine um, Newboy, whose name I'm now, whom I thought, whose name I thought I knew how to pronounce before, but now that she's told me the correct way to pronounce it, I'm just getting completely tongue-tied around it. But Josephine is, is a dear colleague of mine um, at the university, London Metropolitan University, and I'm very excited to hear her talk about her research today. Uh, Josephine is joined by two other colleagues um, who are both coming to us today from Finland. By the power of uh, the internet, we're able to have these wonderful online events where we can uh, embrace international colleagues. So today we have three speakers speaking on the theme of Swedish speaking Finns. So looking at um, minority groups uh, within particular uh, contexts, particular national contexts. Uh, we're going to have three speakers this afternoon. Each speaker will talk for between 15 and 20 minutes. So if I could please ask you to hold back your questions until the end. You can type your questions in the chat. Or at the end, when all three speakers have presented, you can put your hand up and you can ask your question in person. So without further ado, I will kick off by introducing our first speaker who is Dr. Camilla Hartel from um, Obo Academic University in Finland. And she's a researcher within the Center of Excellence. And she's working on a project on demographic change and ethno-linguistic identity in an intergenerational perspective, Swedish speaking populations in Finland. So without further ado, I will hand over to Camilla. You're very welcome to London Metropolitan University, Camilla. Thank you, Louise, and um, thank you, Josephine, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you also, Anna, for this uh, help with everything. Um, so uh, I will uh, start with a short presentation on some demographics on uh, Finnish speakers and Swedish speakers in Finland. And I will tell you a bit about uh, what we know about these groups uh, in how they are doing in terms of uh, health and education and welfare. Uh, so Finnish speakers and Swedish speakers in Finland, they constitute two native population groups uh, and they have equal constitutional rights, which is important to know. And um, uh, the roots uh, of the Swedish speaking population go far back in time when, when Finland was part of Sweden. And at that time, Swedish was the administrative language in Finland and the language of the economic, social and cultural elite in the country. So um, it was spoken among those um, in the top of the society. In uh, 1809, Finland became integrated into the Russian Empire. But the Swedish language maintained its position several decades after that. And uh, it was not until the end of the 19th century when the Finnish language achieved the same status as Swedish in Finland. Um, Finland became independent in 1917 and in the Constitution Act of 1919, both languages were given equal status as official languages for the country. Uh, so this means that Finnish speakers and Swedish speakers have equal constitutional rights and uh, public authorities must provide for their cultural and societal needs on an equal basis. And there are parallel school systems for both groups and a number of organizational and institutional networks that constitute important 
elements of the Swedish speaking society. For example, we have a Swedish speaking brigade or the Finnish army. We have a diocese for all the Swedish speaking parishes within the Lateran Church of Finland, and we have several Swedish speaking organizations and, and societies of different kind. And uh, at the present, Swedish speakers amount to 5.2%, or roughly 290,000 persons of the total population of half, five and a half million. And um, in the early 20th century, proportion was around 12%. So there has been a decrease, which is uh, due to massive migration in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and uh, also due to an increasing number of Finnish speakers and more recently also other ethnicities. And uh, uh, in most ways, uh, the Swedish speakers in Finland are very similar to the Finnish speakers. So we can't differentiate between them, for example, based on appearance or uh, some kind of how they look. And um, they are also quite similar as regards societal values, but uh, they differ culturally. And for example, they have different traditions. And uh, in Nordic context, they are uh, often referred to as a language group, uh, which is descriptive, given that each person in the Finnish population register is uniquely identified by mother tongue. Uh, but uh, in international context, uh, ethnic or ethnolinguistic may be better terms. Uh, the term ethnolinguistic is maybe unfamiliar to many, but uh, it is uh, defined as a human social unit that shares the same language and culture and uses the same criteria to differentiate itself from other social groups. Um, yeah. Another issue related to the portrait of Swedish speaking population in, in Finland revolves around the terms minority and, and nationality. Uh, until the 1850s, language was not the foundation for social ties. So a minority group is uh, something that is quite a modern phenomenon. And uh, the Swedish speakers in Finland have constituted a minority in number for centuries for, uh, for, for a very long time. And uh, before the World War, they were, were some mostly referred to as a nationality. But uh, these terms are not opposites. So nationality embraces the idea of a bilingual country and two historical languages, while minority the image of Swedish speakers as one of Europe's linguistic minorities struggling with the same problems as minorities in general. The uh, position of uh, Swedish, Swedish language has uh, in practice changed towards a minority language. And uh, in that sense, the term minority is good because it helps us to construct strategies and language laws that help the group and the language to survive. Uh, so the regist registering of mother tongue um, in Finland, we have population registers, which include uh, much information on all citizens. And uh, one thing that we know is the mother tongue of, of each citizen. And uh, it is only possible to opt for one mother tongue. So in population studies, ethnic groups can very easily be separated. And that is something that at least I, as a researcher, <coughs> I am very grateful of. It's very practical to be able to do like that. Uh, the mother tongue is chosen by the parents. Quite soon after the child is newborn, it is registered. Uh, the choice is not binding, but uh, much uh, determines which ethnic community the child will be raised within and also which school, school system it will enter later on. There are some practical consequences of the choice. It defines the communication language with the government authorities 
and also with municipal services if the municipality is uh, bilingual. And uh, there has been mandatory teaching of Swedish for Finnish speakers and of Finnish for Swedish speakers in compulsory schools since the mid 1970s. And then some words about uh, intermarriage until the, the second half of the 20th century was notably less common as compared to now. In the 1950s, roughly 20% of all Swedish speakers married a Finnish speaker, and uh, since no, the, the 1980s, the, the proportion has been almost 40%. And there's some interesting asymmetry here because it is more common among Swedish speaking men than women to form a union with a Finnish speaker. And uh, of course, there are uh, children born into these mixed unions, and uh, around 60% of those are registered as Swedish speakers, which uh, of course is good for the Swedish speaking community. Uh, and as said, uh, the choice indicates the parent choice for the dominant ethnicity during childhood, but the, the choice is not binding, so you can always change the mother tongue if so wish. Uh, in the choice, the ethnic affiliation of the mother plays a prominent role, and particularly if she's a Swedish speaker. Uh, sons are somewhat more likely than daughters to be affiliated to the father's ethnic community and daughters to their mother's community. And uh, also, something that is quite interesting is that the higher the educational level of the parents, the higher is the likelihood that the child will be registered as a Swedish speaker. And we don't know exactly why this is, but uh, perhaps their ethnic awareness is above the average, or perhaps their, their uh, cultural variety is more important for them as, as they constitute a minority. So they might look at these things from different perspectives. Uh, it is also possible that uh, the somewhat easier access to higher education in Swedish matters because there are more study places at, at the higher level for those who, who can speak Swedish. And uh, we actually know quite much about these two groups because they have been studied a lot and compared a lot. And in a nutshell, we can say that Swedish speaking population in Finland performs well. And I'll give you some examples from different research areas, which you can see in the small boxes to the left on my presentation. Uh, as compared to Finnish speakers, Swedish speakers are healthier, they live longer and they have longer life expectancy. Uh, but uh, in the socially most successful subgroups, there are no differences, though. And these differences may be due to latent processes by which individuals are selected into education, employment and partnership. And uh, these processes in turn, we think may be related to variation in social cohesion and networks across the ethno-linguistic groups. We also know that Swedish speakers take part in different kinds of happenings and events more often and uh, they have more social capital when measured as trust sense of insecurity social participation and social contacts with family friends and neighbors and even after controlling for factors related to their fav favorable social demographic situation these differences remain uh, yeah and uh, if we go on to education, unemployment and marital stability, we know that uh, Swedish speakers are higher educated than Finnish speakers, but there are large regional differences in education. And uh, these uh, structural differences are also transmitted across generations. Uh, Swedish speakers also have a lower probability of being unemployed. And uh, 
this is not expl explained by differences in uh, local labor market conditions or human capital factors. Uh, one likely reason is that Swedish speakers are the, or, or the higher degree of social integration among them. And it is also possible that they have better language proficiency, proficiency which, which may help them. But I think Marina will talk to you about this, these skills later on. And uh, yep, the high level of social integration may also explain why the divorce rates are lower than among Finnish speakers. And uh, we also know that uh, Swedish speakers, as compared to Finnish speakers, have been underrepresented among manual workers and overrepresented in the agricultural sector. And they have, in a historical perspective, been overrepresented in certain higher socioeconomic categories in the workforce and also in the upper part of the income distribution. Uh, they also show higher wealth levels and they have higher wages and earnings in the Helsinki metropolitan area and here the male group really stands out uh, but uh, there are subst substantial regional differences in, in the distribution of high income as well so it, it is with income as with the education the, it's not the, the same difference everywhere in, in the part of the country uh, Swedish speakers also show a higher degree of income mobility, meaning that a person's earnings are not that much affected by parents' earnings in this group as in the Finnish speaking population. And all these differences, when we, we look at wealth, income and wages, they are partly explained by the higher uh, education among Swedish speakers and also by um, yeah, internal migration because Swedish speakers are less prone than Finnish speakers to migrate inside the country, not outside, but inside the country. And uh, if you look at poverty measured based on income, Swedish speakers have been somewhat more likely to be poor, but the, these um, differences have decreased over time and in practice there are no variation across the groups anymore. So at least uh, based on a great deal of quantitative research on this group, we, we know that it is performing well. Uh, I, I had no figures or tables now. I realized that, that may have been a good idea, but uh, maybe you Got something anyway. And here's a, a list of references. And there are many, many more. Uh, because as I said, we, we know quite much about these two groups and, and how they in comparison. And uh, if you want to know more about them or things that I talked about, just feel free to contact me or ask something here afterwards when when Marina and, and Josephine are done but uh, yeah that's uh, all i had to say and uh, i will leave the word to marina now thank you very much camilla for that very interesting overview i have to admit it's it's not a group that i know very much about so it's good for me to to hear that and i'm sure many people in our audience uh, we're learning lots of new information as well. So thank you very much for your presentation. And we will now hand over to our second speaker, who is Dr. Marina Lindell, also from um, Obo Academic University in Finland, uh, where she's an adjunct professor and senior research fellow at the Social Science Research Institute. And uh, she's now going to pick up on some of these themes and, and add some further insights. So uh, over to you, Marina. Thank you so much, Louise, for this kind presentation. Um, yeah, yeah that, there's my presentation as well. So I will talk a little bit about the Swedish speaking Finns and how they perceive their sem the, themselves, how they perceive the language climate, and then a little bit about how the Finnish speakers perceive 
the Swedish speaking Finns in Finland. And I start with showing a, a picture. This is uh, part of Finland. And uh, the municipalities that are colored, that's where the Swedish speaking Finns, uh, or most of them, live. We have uh, 310 municipalities in Finland. And out of these, 33 are bilingual. 18 of these bilingual municipalities has a Swedish minority and 15 of them has a Swedish majority. So there are 50 municipalities where the Swedish speaking is a majority in the municipality. And in addition, we have 16 Swedish speaking municipalities in the Åland Islands, uh, and these are not Finnish speaking at all. And in Finland, local authorities, or shall, shall I say local and regional authorities, because we have a, a, a reform going on in social and healthcare services, but in general, local and regional, regional authorities are responsible for provision of basic services to their residents. This means that in, in bilingual municipalities, the authorities have to give services in both Finnish and Swedish when it comes to social and health healthcare services, education, urban planning, different type of infrastructure, cultural activities, leisure services, and so on. And uh, 1.75 million, actually, of the people in Finland lives in bilingual municipalities. And as you see on the map, most of the, the municipalities with uh, most of the bilingual municipalities with Swedish as a minority, they are based in the south of Finland, uh, mainly around the capital uh, area, around Helsinki. And the municipalities where Swedish is a majority, they are mainly based in Ostrobotnia, that's the region on the western coast of Finland, uh, where Vasa and Robokademi also has a campus. The data I used, I will show you a lot of numbers and figures, and all the data comes from three different uh, data sources. Uh, we have an online citizen panel that was established in 2019 called Barometan. It consists of 4,700 Swedish speaking Finns uh, in Finland. It's managed by me uh, and by Åbo Academy University and supported by Swedish Cultural Foundation. We have a little, little information about this in English uh, on our website, but may, most of the information is unfortunately only in Swedish. Uh, then we also have another citizen panel similar to the Barometan. Uh, it's in Finnish called Kansalaismelipide, uh, and it consists of 4,300 Finnish speakers. And this is also a citizen online panel uh, managed by Åbo Academy University, but supported by the Academy of Finland. And then we have another survey or a study called the Language Barometer, which is done every fourth year. Uh, it's uh, managed by the Ministry of Justice, but Åbo Academy University has been doing it in practice. And this has been done since 2004, and it was lastly conducted in 2020. And uh, this is an interesting survey because it's, uh, it measures how the Language Act works in practice. And it asks the people who live in bilingual municipalities whether they get services in their language or not, and, and how good the services are working, and how they feel about the language climate, uh, and so on. So I will not. Uh, tell you any more about these uh, or refer to them, but you know that all the data that I show comes from these data sources. So if we start by looking at the ethno-linguistic identity and how, the, the, how they perceive themselves, we know that uh, many Swedish speakers in Finland are of course bilingual, but not maybe as many, many as you would think. Uh, this is from the language barometer survey, but this is this uh, we see the same numbers in other surveys as well. And 55% uh, of the Swedish speakers 
living in a bilingual municipality feel that they are bilingual. This means that 45% feel like unilingual Swedish speakers. And looking at the Finnish speakers who also live in these bilingual municipalities, we see that 41% feels bilingual, that they know Finnish and Swedish almost equal well. But there are lots of regional uh, differences here. You know, you see that in, in Nyland, which is the region where around Helsinki, the share of bilingual Swedish speakers are much, much larger than in other areas. And then if we asked, we also asked them about how they, how good they are in Finnish and Swedish. And here you see when they eval evaluate their own language skills on a scale from four to 10, the Swedish speakers say that, oh, in a, on average, uh, my skills in Finnish are eight. And the Finnish speakers say that, well, my skills are around 6.4. So the Finnish Swedish speakers know much better. They're much more fluent in Finnish than, than Finnish speakers in Swedish, which is, of course, due to that Finnish is the majority language uh, in Finland. Uh, we know that uh, how you feel, if you feel like a Swedish speaking Finn, uh, that has changed a bit lately. Usually, if you were born as a Swedish speaker, you, you felt like a Swedish speaking Finn. But now uh, people migrate, people marry, they marry across uh, language groups. You have friends from the other language groups. You might, perhaps you work uh, in Finnish, although you are Swedish speakers or vice versa. So the identity of a Swedish speaking Finn is much more complex than before. It's not just that you're born into it. You can easily adapt to it in, in other ways. But still, I think most researchers would agree that the Swedish language is still a central cultural feature of the Swedish speaking, Swedish speaking Finn identity. And the minority identity is really, really strong. And there is also a really strong feeling of community uh, within these language groups. Uh, they have their own networks, community, institutions, organizations, schools, newspapers, and so on. But what it really means to be a Swedish speaking Finn, that has, has, has also changed. Because as you, as you saw, we have a, quite a big share of bilinguals. And they maybe don't feel as or identify as Swedish speaking Finns. They might just as easily identify as Finnish speakers in some context. So what it means to be a Finnish speaker or a Swedish, spe Swedish speakers overlaps in many contexts. So you might have many different cultural identities. Uh, and we have also seen in our surveys that there is an increased feeling of inferiority. Tolerance towards minority groups in Finland has decreased. Swedish speakers feel like second class citizens and Swedish is a language that they only use at home. Uh, here you see the, the share who say that Swedish is a language I only use among family and friends. Uh, you see that uh, uh, 75% says that Swedish is just a language that I use among family and friends. I don't use it like in town or in the evenings or in public places. And this is, of course, this raises lots of concerns, of course. And also 38% says that if I use Swedish, I am considered a second class citizen. They, they, they feel like, like a second class citizen. And this is, of course, also troublesome. But then 81% still think that there is a future for the Swedish language in Finland, which, which is, of course, uh, a, very, uh, a very nice thing. And here have, we have also asked how they feel about being a Swedish speaking Finn. And as you see, 96% are very proud of being a Swedish speaking Finn. So this is not something that you are ashamed of. You're really proud that you belong to this minority. And they uh, also think 81% says that they, they think that the community of Swedish speaking Finns, it's open and it's inclusive uh, and so on. 
And looking at how they feel uh, among Finnish speakers, they say that, that they experience that Finnish speakers want to keep to themselves and that they don't really show interest in, in the Swedish speaking population. 62% says that, that this is how they feel. And also uh, a majority, 58% feels that among Finnish speakers, uh, that they feel the attitudes among Finnish speakers to Swedish in Finland have deteriorated over the past two years. And I will show this uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a slide um, later, how the language climate, uh, how they perceive it uh, in Finland. And 58% says that they think that Swedish speakers have the same opportunities as Finnish speakers in today's Finland. But if you look at, at how much do not, how, how, how a large proportion that don't agree with this statement, it's 42% who actually feels that they don't have the same opportunities as Finnish speakers in Finland. And this also, of course, raises some concerns. And also 55% feels that the no that knowledge of Swedish is becoming less and less important, which is of course also racist concerns. And a majority thinks that Finland is not a well-functioning bilingual country. 53% think it's not a well-functioning, only 47% thinks that it's a well-functioning bilingual country. So there is some good things and some things that might need to be addressed and, and that uh, is a bit concerning. And then in another survey, we asked the Finnish speakers how they perceive the Swedish speaking minority. And as you see and at these numbers, they are also a bit mixed. 60% uh, of those who speak Swedish think that, who speak Finnish, think that Swedish is an essential part of Finnish society. And if you remember, from the slide before, 81% of the Swedish speakers felt that there is a future for the Swedish language in Finland. So uh, not Swedish speakers are a bit more optimistic regarding the future of the Swedish language in Finland. And 63% of the Finnish speakers think that knowledge of Swedish is becoming less and less important compared to 55% of the Swedish speakers. So a majority of both language groups feel that you don't need to know Swedish. It's not that important anymore. It's becoming less and less important. And this is, of course, not good. And English is, of course, also in Finland uh, becoming more and more important. And, and sometimes as a Swedish speaking Finns, you might get services in English, but not in Swedish. Uh, so, so that's, of course, also a bit troublesome for some groups. Uh, then we have, they have to learn Swedish in schools, not for many years, but for a few years. It's mandatory. And this is something that is constantly debated in Finland because the Finnish speakers don't really like to learn Finnish in school. And here also in this survey, 66% said that they want it to be voluntary. They don't want to have to learn Swedish in schools. But still, 71% says that oh, it would be nice to have better knowledge of Swedish. So, so they are somewhat positive towards the Swedish language, but they don't want to make any efforts in learning it. But almost or, or over uh, one fourth still would be ready to put their children in a Swedish speaking school. So they would want their children to learn Swedish as well. And then about a third think that it's positive if a Swedish speaking Finns starts a conversation with them in, in Swedish. But 22% thinks that this is not a good thing. They, they uh, have negative experience about this. And 34% think that Swedish speaking Finns are arrogant. And 47% think that Swedish speaking Finns, they just want to keep to themselves and isolate themselves. And they are not interested in, in the Finnish speaking uh, population compared to 62% of the Swedish speakings who actually also felt the same way that Finns they want to keep to themselves. So we have something to work on here to get the, the language groups more connected uh, to each other. 
the language climate, as I said, it had deteriorated in the last years in Finland. Uh, if we look at, at surveys since 2002, uh, we can see that in 2012, uh, around 2012, 13, 14, something happened. Uh, and, the, lang and the, the perceptions of the language climate became much more negative than they were before. Since uh, 2018, 19, we haven't seen any, it, it hasn't gotten any worse, but it hasn't gotten any better either. It has kind of stayed at the same level as it, as it did. So compared to the early 2000, uh, like in 2002, the language climate is much more negative these days than it was then. And as you see in this picture, it's mainly in, uh, in mass media where, they, where people feel that there is a, a negative language climate in social media, but also in national politics. Uh, and this, these results are also confirmed in many studies that they, Swedish speakers feel that the language climate is negative. It is, it is troublesome. And here we asked if they have faced prejudice, harassment or discrimination because of their language. And uh, this survey was done in the bilingual municipalities. So we also asked the Finnish speakers in these bilingual municipalities whether they have faced prejudice, harassment or discrimination, especially if they live in a municipality where Swedish is the majority language. And as you see, 26% uh, of the Swedish speakers have faced prejudice and harassment in the last uh, two years, compared to 17% of the Finnish speakers. And 21% of both language groups has faced discrimination because of their language. Compared to 2016, you see that the share has gone down. It's not directly comparable because the wording of the question somewhat changed, it, changed from 2016 to, to, to 2020. But we still can see that, that it's less prejudice, harassment and discrimination now than it was uh, four years ago. But then if you see according to age, uh, you see that uh, younger people still face much more prejudice and harassment than older people do. And this might, of course, be because they, they are at cafes, they use public transport, they visit nightclubs, they spend time on social media, all these places where prejudice and harassment uh, are much more common than in other places. So what does the language climate depends on? Why is it good? Why, why is it bad? Why, how, why do you perceive it in a positive way or in a negative way? Well, it depends on, on many, many different things. But for example, of course, the attitudes of the majority population, also the local majority in the municipality. If the attitudes from the majority population are quite positive, then of course, you, you also as a minority think that the language climate is uh, positive, more positive. The public debate has an impact. If the public debate is really harsh and really negative towards Swedish speaking Finns, as many newspapers have, they have a, 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 neg a negative wording or a negative debate, then this affects, of course, the feeling of how the language climate feels. Knowledge and awareness of the language is spoken in the country, of course. Uh, one important question that has been popping up in many of our many of our, our studies is the possibility is to use your own language with authorities. If you can use Swedish when you go to the doctor or when you visit the library or when you use public transport, then you also have a much more favorable perception of the language climate. The share of the minority might might have an impact. Language skills, of course, if I know Finnish better, then I might also feel that the language climate is better. And then, of course, contact between language group. If I have a friend that is, is Finnish speaker or if a Finnish speaker has a friend that is Swedish speaker, this might be uh, also 
have, has a positive impact on the language climate. And this is my last slide. Since services in Swedish is so important and, and it has been debated quite a lot in Finland recently because this is something that is a problem in many regions and in many municipalities that you don't get services in Swedish. Uh, so 22% of the Swedish speakers actually say that they don't even ask, they don't even bother to ask for services in Swedish anymore, although they have a legal right to do it. And 57% says that oh, they always get an answer, they, they will still be answered in Finnish, even if they start in Swedish. And 59% said that, that if there is a Finnish speaker in the group, they will automatically turn to Swedish, even if there would be four Swedish speakers and there is one Finnish speakers, uh, almost 60% will turn to Finnish instead. Sorry for taking a bit uh, more time, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, and now continuing on the theme, but perhaps uh, taking us in a slightly different direction, um, we're going to hear from our London Met colleague, uh, Dr. Josephine uh, Naibu, who is a senior lecturer in applied social policy and practice. And Josephine is now going to look at the situation of Swedish speaking Finns abroad and the way in which living abroad might impact on kind of experiences of, of identity. Over to you, Josephine. Thank you, Louise, and, and thank you, uh, Anna. Are you putting up my slides or would you like me to do it? Well, thank you very much, Anna. Um, and thank you also, uh, Camilla and Marina, for giving a really nice overview of um, the Swedish speaking Finns in Finland. Um, and what we've learned thus far now is from uh, from Camilla's presentation, for example, when it comes to education and, and health, Swedish speaking Finns tend to do better than Finnish speaking Finns. Um, but on the other hand, what, what Marina now highlighted uh, as well is this um, experience of discrimination based on, on, on language. But at the same time, um, and I'm not sure Marina highlighted this today, but uh, there is a very, uh, well, you pointed it out indeed, that there's a very strong sense of community within the Swedish speaking Finnish community and a sense of belonging uh, to that. So um, I think, um, and this is really a research in really that has started now so there will be no um, results that we're able to to present but uh, I've been really lucky to have Camilla and Marina with me who are very enthusiastic about starting also to look at uh, Swedish speaking Finns abroad um, and what their sense of community and home and belonging is. So as we said, there is a very strong, or as Marina said, there is a very strong sense of community and belonging uh, amongst the Swedish speaking Finns, but what is it like when they move abroad? So this really relates to uh, studies uh, of diasporas really, and where the sense of home and community and belonging is indeed very important. But what does it mean then when you're a minority in your native country and uh, an alien in another, if you will, where do you then belong? Where do you send, uh, where do you have, where do you feel you belong and where is your home then? So this is something that uh, we will look more into over the next few months. Um, but let's start with looking at who are the Finns who live abroad. So if we talk about Finnish citizens in general who live abroad, um, as Camilla pointed out earlier, well, that was more in relation to, to, to Swedish speaking Finns in particular, um, but Finns tend to move abroad uh, to work or to study, but also to get new life experiences. Um, and this is, Often, often starts as a long-term temporary migration, but it tends to be permanent when relationships are formed abroad. 
Uh, and it also needs to be pointed out that there are substantially more Finnish citizens that leave uh, than expats then returning home to Finland. And I'm going to take the pointer so you know on what point I am. Um, the Finns who move abroad are highly skilled, so they have high education levels. Uh, and this also leads uh, to uh, a lot of Finns ending up in full-time employment when they move abroad. This has been uh, found in several surveys, for example, working in, in the Working in Europe survey from 2008. And uh, there's approximately 300,000 Finnish citizens live outside Finland. Um, and where they move depends a little bit depending on language here as well. Uh, but Sweden is uh, a country where many Finns move to, uh, and also the other Scandinavian countries, Norway in particular. But we also have Finnish citizens moving to the United Kingdom, to Germany, to the US, and also um, to Spain. So if that then is the Finnish, spe uh, Finnish speakers abroad, uh, what about the Swedish speaking Finns abroad? Uh, so um, it's quite interesting because there's approximately 31,000 or 13% of all Swedish speaking Finns live abroad. And we can compare this to the 5.7% of Finns living abroad. And that number then includes all Swedish speaking Finns. So this is uh, what uh, Camilla pointed out that Swedish speaking Finns tend to move abroad, but don't move within the country, they remain, uh, uh, sorry, move within Finland. So they tend to remain in the same spots, but when they move, they move abroad. Um, and perhaps not so surprisingly, uh, 23,000 of these 31,000 Swedish speaking Finns abroad live in Sweden. And if we look into how many Swedish speaking Finns there are in the UK, there's about a thousand of us. And just to go back to this 13% to put it in perspective, um, I think if we compare to comparable countries, uh, we uh, we can see, I think it's new, no, sorry, Ireland has the highest um, um, uh, migration or percentage, there's about 17% of the Irish population who, who, who live abroad. And then we have New Zealand and Portugal at around 14%, and then the Swedish speaking population at 13%. And then compare that to the Finnish, all the Finnish um, citizens living abroad, which is 5.7%. And there are many reasons as to why Swedish speaking Finns move abroad. And Harbert has looked into certain push and pull factors. And if we begin with the, uh, with the pull factors, um, we can see that those are usually work, going out to work or going to seek adventure. Uh, family reasons might also be one of the pull factors uh, as to why Swedish speaking Finns move abroad. And family reasons might also be the push factor as to why Swedish speaking film, uh, film Finns move abroad. Um, but a, two particular um, um, push factors as to why Swedish speaking Finns move abroad is the language barriers and also the societal climate in Finland. And that includes then uh, the, the language climate between uh, between Swedish and Swedish and um, Finnish speakers. So let's go to the next slide as well. So we can say that not only are the Swedish speaking Finns more um, or they move abroad to a much greater extent than the Swedish is Finnish speaking Finns, but they're also li less likely to return to Finland. So there are a lot of Swedish speaking Finns abroad and their experiences of home and belonging have been done um, to and how they're doing have been done um, to some extent. 
um, Harjulan Himmelroos um, did a survey a few years ago um, um, that was aimed at 4,800 Swedish-speaking Finns in 15 countries. And out of these, there was 2,000 uh, who responded to this survey. Uh, and what came out in this survey is that there is a stronger trust in Finnish institutions and political systems in uh, compared to the country that you move to. And mind you, this of course depends on what country you have moved to, but still there is a significant, um, a significant bigger uh, or stronger trust to Finnish institutions, such as the education system, the healthcare system, the police, uh, and also to the political system than that of the country of residence. Um, Harulan Himmelroos also pointed out that there's a stronger feeling of community to the Swedish, to Swedish speaking Finland than to Finland. And mind you, there is still a very strong uh, connection to both the Swedish speaking Finland and to Finland uh, for people living abroad. Uh, but um, there is uh, still a reluctancy to return um, for Swedish speaking Finns living abroad. Um, and there are many reasons as to why this is the case. Um, family reasons, work commitment that you have abroad, but another big reason as to why Swedish speaking um, uh, Finns abroad do not want to return to Finland is the weak position of the Finnish language in Finland. And as Marina pointed out earlier, uh, the climate or the, the language climate as it's called, as we refer it to, is, 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 is not great at the moment. So this also then leads to more Swedish speaking Finns being more reluctant to return to Finland, even if you, even if you feel very connected to Finland. So this is um, this is a, a an upcoming study that I want to tell you about that will hopefully now, as I said, take place over the next few months. And and I think this is where uh, we would really appreciate some input as well, particularly from Louise as well here. Um, but the aim is to uh, get a more um, a better understanding, a deeper understanding of how the Swedish-speaking fin Finnish diaspora experiences and understands home, and that meaning both Finland but also the country of residence, but also how they experience community and what the sense of belonging is. Um, and this would then be focusing on Swedish speaking Finns residing permanently outside. So it wouldn't be those who go to study abroad for six months, for example, but more um, those who go to study, but also those who have moved to, to work, for example. Um, and this sense of belonging then, and, and what does that mean? Well, um, Marina's research has pointed that, that, that we do feel a lot of uh, Swedish speaking Finns do feel a strong sense of belonging to Finland in particular to the Swedish speaking community, but also to the Nordic countries. Um, but what do we mean by this? And this, um, this is to be a qualitative uh, research, so it's not going to be a survey. Um, and the concept of belonging is something that we could discuss uh, for a very long time. But I'm thinking perhaps Peter Bloch's uh, understanding of belonging as it being two different or two aspects to it. On the one hand, it's to be part of something uh, or the experience of being at home. Uh, on the other hand, it's also about actively building something, about being a co-owner, uh, of a community. So ideally now um, we will be able to do some semi-structured interviews uh, looking for Swedish speaking 
uh, fins broad. And how this is to be done, um, I think we're going to try to get some media attention on this. And hopefully that will then have a snowball effect as well and, and, and more will be uh, willing to participate in this. I think the big question here is, is are we to exclude Swedish speaking Finns living in Sweden? Um, and on the one hand, it could be quite beneficial to keep them, uh, this particular group in the study as well, because there are so many of Swedish speaking Finns living in Sweden. However, there has been qualitative studies on Swedish speaking Finns living in Sweden um, before. So uh, really what uh, to my knowledge, anyway, there is a research gap uh, when it comes to qualitative studies done on Swedish speaking Finns living in other countries than in Finland and Sweden. And this then is to be the data. Uh, once we've collected it, uh, the data is to be analyzed through con uh, qualitative content analysis, uh, quite possibly the conventional content analysis. Uh, uh, analysis uh, or uh, through directed content analysis. Um, it will be really interesting to to see what this will bring and I cannot show you any results yet because there is no such thing. Um, so but this is I think where I will really open up to the to the to the floor and and and, and to Louise as well and and I see there are a few. I see there are a few questions in the in the chat, and I'm sure we can address them um, together collectively. So thank you. Thank you very much, Josephine. And I'm very excited about your new project. Um, we had an opportunity to discuss it before briefly. So yeah, I, I think there's lots of interesting things we can talk about there. So thank you very much to the three speakers. And as you can see, there are some questions uh, in the chat. So if I just, and if anybody else has a question, you can be thinking about it now and maybe getting ready to put your hand up. But just going to look at the questions in the chat, I can see one from uh, Cecile, Bernie, Wendy, and Jane Lewis. Oh no, Jane Lewis is just saying that she's very interested and thank you very much and she has to go. <laughs> so the three questions are from Wendy, uh, Bernie and Cecile. So I don't know if you three would like to put your hand up or turn your microphone on and ask your question or you're happy for, for us to just read what's written in the chat. I hope everybody in the um, audience has found the chat. Uh, it's in the additional panel with the purple X on the right hand side of the screen. So would anybody like to start picking up on some of those questions? So Camilla or Marina or Josephine yourself? Yes, uh, uh, um, uh, Cecile writes that he's asked for me as my camera is not working. So uh, I can um, I can read um, the question and try to answer. And uh, Marina and Josephine, if you have something to say, just do it. Uh, Cecile wonders if uh, the impact of other minority languages in Helsinki for example, Somali Spanish, are there any other minority groups in Helsinki? And yes, uh, of course there are. We have had, uh, compared to many other countries, Finland has had little uh, immigration, but uh, things have changed. And now we have, uh, of course, uh, other minority groups as well. We have Russian people, we have Somali people, and uh, and many, many other ethnicities. Uh, and uh, they sure feel discriminated also. Uh, um, but uh, there's one difference as compared to the Swedish speakers, and uh, that is that uh, Swedish speakers have the same constitutional rights as the Finnish speakers. So that means that they actually, they have the same uh, right to, to get education in their own language, uh, they should get health care in their own language and, and so on. So that's the difference. Of course, uh, municipalities try to, to teach also other minorities in their language is, if it's possible, but it's not always possible. But uh, if there's a Swedish speaker, uh, the person has the right to, to get 
education in, in his own or her own language. So, thank, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Camilla. Um, I can see that uh, Peter has a question, but, but maybe you can just hang on to your question for a moment, Peter, because we've got two pre-existing questions in the chat. Uh, so Bernie is saying, could you provide examples of the kind of prejudice and discrimination that Swedish speaking Finns might experience? And then there's also a question from Wendy. Uh, so maybe we could invite Wendy to turn her microphone on and ask her question in a moment. But perhaps you'd like to begin by answering Bernie's question. And I don't know if that's which of the three of you would like to respond to that. So she's looking for some specific examples. I could start and then maybe Camilla and Josephine, you can add things that I forget. Uh, it's mostly like uh, negative comments like, ah, you're speaking Swedish and then they don't even bother to engage anymore. Uh, we have a, or oh, what's the word in English, a dirty word called hurri, where you say that, ah, they call Swedish speakers hurri and that is really have a negative connotation to it. Uh, for long, there has also been, uh, comments like in Finland we speak Finnish but don't bother to speak Swedish and I would say 10-15 years ago it was a lot of physical fights as well in the streets uh, during the evenings when people got drunk. I don't see this as much anymore. It's much more uh, psychological or a feeling of being a difficult person because we want services in Swedish and uh, that people are tired of us asking to get the services. Uh, Finnish speakers roll their eyes, maybe turn away. And, and one thing that constantly also pops up in these services that they feel excluded because they don't get the same information. Information should in bilingual municipalities, you need to send all information in Finnish and Swedish, but this is not really working in practice. Thank you very much, Marina. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that or if we should then go to Wendy's question. Wendy, would you like to turn your microphone on and ask your question? Uh, yes, hello. Hi, thank you. This has been really interesting. Hi, and I'm sorry, I have a misspelling in my question in Finnish and I apologize. But I'm just wondering if there's any kinship between the Swedish speaking minority in Finland and the Romani who speak Romani but also speak Swedish and came originally from Sweden and how they fit in with what you're talking about. I have done a few stories on Swedish gypsies as they were then called and they seem to face perhaps more discrimination than anybody in Finland, probably even more than foreigners who come from outside Finland to migrate there. So I'm wondering if, if you could talk at all about how the Swedish minority gets on with the Romani, etc. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. So who would like to respond to Wendy's question? Maybe I could give it a go. And, and Wendy, thanks for joining us. It was really interesting um, or really happy. I'm really glad that you came to um, discuss this with us today. Um, so if I understand this correctly now, if let's say you were to move to Sweden, you register your uh, mother tongue. And currently, and correct me if I'm wrong, Camilla and Marina, it's either Finnish Swedish or other. Um, as I say, correct me if I'm wrong. And this is different from the way we register ethnicity or group or whatever in the UK, where we go into um, ethnicity. Um, and so, of course, there is a massive variation within the Swedish speaking, uh, Swedish speaking Finnish community as well. And just like we can see uh, here in the UK, Irish travelers, for example, they are the most discriminated uh, against when it comes to access to education and healthcare and so on. Uh, I can. I, I don't know the statistics on this, but I could definitely see that this would indeed be the case um, in Finland as well. And they would probably be facing um, discrimination from many, from other 
perspectives as well. On the one hand, we have the, the Swedish language, but also the cultural uh, background there that comes into play. Um, so I don't know if that um, answers your question, Wendy, but maybe um, someone else could pick up on that um, or we can have a discussion on it. Um, I, I mean, I imagine they face discrimination from everyone, including Finnish speaking Finns and Swedish speaking Finns. And people who come from other countries, so they really are the bottom on the on the totem pole. It's just a shame mm -hmm. is there is some type of linguistic kinship, I guess, between Swedish speaking Finns to a degree and mm -hmm. Romani who came originally from Sweden to Finland. Mm. But I guess before mm. that they came from somewhere else. But yeah, it's just it's just it was a little bit interesting to me just because they weren't included at all in your presentation. And and you know, maybe there's a reason. I don't know. I mean, maybe the Swedish speaking minority doesn't include them at all as any part of the Swedish speaking minority, but it's just something that would be interesting to go into a, a little bit further. Thank you. I could uh, just quickly respond. Uh, the Swedish speaking minority that is included in, the re in my research, they might be part of that if they are registered as Swedish speakers in Finland. I don't know, but uh, I think many of them are actually Finnish speakers today, although they came from, from Sweden as well. Uh, but you are right that, that uh, they face a lot of discrimination, much more than, than other groups. Yes, I, I also agree with Marina. Uh, I think they are, most of the Romani are, uh, uh, they might be Swedish, registered as Swedish speakers, but uh, I, I think most of them are Finnish speakers. Uh, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. And thanks for your question, Wendy. So I can see that Pat Peter uh, has a question. Peter, would you like to turn your microphone on and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. OK, um, this is a fascinating set of presentations. I'm really delighted. My interest and reason for signing in is mainly as a linguist. Um, I'm a sociolinguist, and I've directed a number of PhDs over the year on language shift, although that's not my area of research. But I have also taught for a long time on language and human rights. Um, so this is a great topic for both of those. And I have a, a sort of a background question about the degree of what I take to be language shift towards Finnish and away from Swedish in the Swedish speaking population. Yeah. Um, Camilla, in your presentation, you mentioned that the proportion of Swedish speaking Finns had sort of halved over time, but you didn't give a change in absolute numbers. And I just wonder, is there any clear sense of whether there has been a reduction and increase or a stable um, state in terms of the number of people, the absolute number of people speaking Swedish and identifying as Swedish speaking Finns? In other words, is there a language shift going on or is it stable bilingualism? Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, there has been a decrease in number as well. Uh, and um, yeah, there used to be in the uh, in the early 19th century, they were about 340,000 Swedish speakers. And uh, now it has decreased to 290,000. About So yes, there is a, a decrease in number as well. Uh, which is it, um, much because of the the massive migration. They left the country. Uh, I think about 40,000 Swedish speakers left the country in the 50s and 60s. OK, thank you for that. Um, and I'm wondering if I can just briefly follow up. So there is language shift occurring, perhaps. Um, Migration doesn't necessarily mean that there are fewer speakers. It just means they're abroad, perhaps. Yeah. But is there also language shift in the sense that over time within a family, within a community, 
people who used to be and identify as Swedish speaking Finns are now Finnish speaking primarily and not Swedish speaking anymore. Um, I think uh, it's um, uh, the intermarriage has become much more common now. And as uh, Marina also said, this is it's um, being a Swedish speaker, it's really complex. Uh, but uh, at least 60% of, uh, of the children in these mixed families are registered as Swedish speakers. So there we see that uh, there is like a will to, to keep this um, community and the language alive. Yeah, it's really yeah. difficult to estimate these things sometimes because linguists are also very interested in language attitudes and ideologies. And we do surveys of people in shifting communities. <clears throat> and we find that often people report their beliefs rather than their behaviors. And they often don't always objectively know their behaviors. That is, when studies observe them in the home as well as surveying them, they find that what they do when observed is different than what they report. Um, because people have such strong beliefs about language. So that, that's one of the reasons it's such a fascinating area. Um, I wonder if you all are familiar with um, the linguist Tuvis Kutnabkangas, the Finnish linguist, and her work. Uh, she's a very well-known Finnish linguist who is also uh, one of the premier scholars and activists in the area of language and human rights. And she has given several definitions of what mother tongue means to be used in different situations. I'd be happy to share that with you later, which allows us to understand what people mean when they say my mother tongue is X, my mother tongue is Y, um, but they actually have different behaviors. So that's something I'd be happy to, to share, but I don't want to dominate this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to have a, another perspective. So thank you for that. Are there any other, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So would anybody else um, like to turn their microphone on and ask a question or put their hand up and, and ask a question? So in the meantime, Josephine is, is typing um, email addresses in the chat. So thank you for that, Josephine. Does anybody else have any questions or would uh, Josephine like to kind of do a bit of a, a wrap up? I'm putting you on the spot now, Josephine. Oh, somebody has put their hand up. Well, I can't see who that is. That's Pat, the Peter again. Oh, it's yes, Peter I'm again. Sorry. Oh, I, I just, I just have one more question. <laughs> um, and that is, I wonder if this requirement, legal requirement to only specify, only register one mother tongue is itself an agent of language shift. Because it, from your descriptions, it sounds like, first of all, most Finns are bilingual as far as linguists are concerned. We have a low standard for who is a bilingual. We recognize many kinds of bilingualism. Um, and so the requirement to only register one mother tongue might itself be pushing people uh, towards or away from embracing um, Swedish as a mother tongue under certain circumstances. And I just wonder if you have any ideas about that. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Actually, that's an interesting observation. So you can only register one mother tongue. So that is kind of pushing people into one box or another. Is that correct? Uh, I understood that you can only register one from the presentations, and I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, yes, exactly. I was just seeking clarification from one of our Finnish colleagues. Is that correct? You can only register one mother tongue? Yes, that's correct. Just one mother tongue. Um, of course, it's a, a bit problematic. And perhaps, Marina, you, you know more about this. There has been a discussion about this uh, because there has, has been a wish for uh, the possibility to, to opt for more than one one language, but I, I don't know what's what's happening with that now. Yeah, I. it is, uh, as you rightly said, Peter, it might be a problem for the Swedish speakers, since you only can register with one language. 
and the language that you're registered with, you will get all the information in that language. So if you are bilingual, but you feel a bit uh, more, you feel a bit more closer to the Finnish language, then you will probably register as a Finnish speaker although you might know Swedish just as well as Finnish or have your mother might be Swedish speaker. But if you want all the information from authorities uh, in Finnish, then you need to register in Finnish. And um, there has been a, a, a discussion about whether you should also be able to register a second language, but so far, no luck. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just thinking about the Irish context where, you know, I learned Irish at school. I'm from Ireland. I learned Irish at school. It's compulsory. But I would be very, very hard pressed now to carry out a conversation in the Irish language. I would really struggle to do so. But nonetheless, um, I, I have a, a kind of a, an affinity, maybe a romantic affinity with the Irish language. But there is no way that I could read official documents in the Irish language. And so maybe it is about kind of that complex relationship between identity and an almost kind of romantic association with language as a way of celebrating an ethnic identity and a heritage and a culture and tradition versus something which is very practical, like could you read a tax form in that language? And so maybe we're kind of blurring those boundaries here that people may have an affiliation as a sort of Swedish cultural background, but they're not ticking that box. So the numbers may be very inaccurate, but it goes to maybe Josephine's point about the importance of qualitative research to really explore what are often very messy identity issues that don't fit in narrow sort of tick box formats. But but I think we're, we're getting into some very interesting sociological issues here now. Uh, so I don't know if there are any other questions or comments. I can see that Peter has typed some uh, reference in the chat, but maybe I can now hand over to you, Josephine, to do some sort of final wrapping up comments and, and tell us a bit more about the next steps for your research. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Louise. And, and apologies, I put uh, Marina and Camilla's uh, emails in the chat and they were not in the same format as the London Met one. So apologies. <laughs> so use the ones that Camilla and, and Marina has put out there themselves. Um, well, I just want to thank you, Louise, uh, really for this opportunity to, to bring my culture into uh, London Met and thank you to uh, to Camilla and Marina for for being so enthusiastic uh, about this. This is something that has happened um, uh, quite quickly. So I'm really glad that Marina and, and Camilla, with all their knowledge, they've, they've taken this on as well. Um, so now we know a little bit more about uh, we we have maybe a little bit more nuanced picture of Finland and the Finnish uh, Finnish population indeed. Um, so I think this was a, a a great opportunity now to to on the one hand tell uh, the audience a little bit about Swedish speaking Finns, uh, but also to test water in in terms of this upcoming um, study, which I really hope will take place and I'll be get, getting going with the research ethics forms now as soon as I just can. Um, so thank you very much. It means a lot to to all Swedish speaking Finns um, that you all came here and, and, and listened. So thank you very much. And if Marina and Camilla want to say some final words, just uh, feel free to to chip in here. I just want to thank you, Josephine, for arranging this seminar. And I'm really enthusiastic about your upcoming research, because this is something that has not been done, uh, at least not to my knowledge. So I'm looking very much forward to to being part of it. And good luck. And thank you, Marina, for your presentation today. It was so enlightening for those of us who knew so little about this topic. And I just wonder if Camilla also wants to. Yes, I'd like to thank you also 
uh, as I said in the beginning, Josephine, for inviting me, and uh, it's going to be really, really nice to, to work with you. We we haven't cooperated before, but now we will, and it's going to be really, really nice. And thank you. Thank you. So. On behalf of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre here at London Metropolitan University, I'd like to thank everybody who attended today and a special thank you to our three speakers, Josephine, Camilla and Marina. And also just to thank our colleague Anna, who always attends these events and provides great support from the research office. Um, and the event was recorded. I can't remember if we actually said at the beginning that the event was recorded, but yes, we're recording the event. And uh, also to um, just let you know that we have lots of other interesting seminars coming up in the Research Centre programme, and we look forward to seeing you at some of those events in the future. So thank you very much for attending and uh, best of luck with your research, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>